Welcome everyone to our last online service for October 2021. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will be praising His name in prayer and song and word and thought. Let us go into worship now. And of course let us begin with a responsive call to worship please respond to my reading of the small text by replying in the larger. Let us start this service by reminding ourselves that it is not we who choose Christ, but Christ who chooses us. That we are not here because of our goodness, but because of Christ's grace. That we are not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow Christ to enlighten us. That we have not come to be entertained, but to worship God with heart, soul, mind and strength. As I light our Christ candle today, this being Halloween, the day when the world seems to celebrate darkness, we remember that in fact it celebrates the triumph of light over darkness, Jesus, the light of the world, granting us eternal life. And now we're going to say together our prayer of approach. So let us pray together. God who is faithful forever, you are our God. We turn to you in praise for when our hope remains in you, we find rest. We turn to you with our cares for when we look to you for help, we find strength. We turn our hearts to you in worship, offering love for you and for our neighbour. We offer you our love in the name of Jesus, who teaches us to love, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who inspires us to love. Amen. When it comes to good news this week, I have two birthdays to share. One just happens to be mine on Tuesday, and the second is next Saturday. That's the birthday of Laverne Hurd. So happy birthday to you, Laverne. You've picked a good week to have a birthday. Thank you for everything that you do for our church. It's much appreciated. You and June find some special way to celebrate your birthday. Happy birthday and congratulations. We've reached the part of our service where we share together the Lord's Prayer. And as I say, we will pray this together as we always do. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we did last week, we're going to turn to the book of Psalms for our first passage from Scripture. This week, let's hear Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. 
When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Now moving on through the Gospel of Mark, we turn to chapter 12 and we're going to hear verses 28 to 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. As Christians, we are called to live as well as we can, but sometimes that's more difficult than others. Thank goodness that God offers us the grace of forgiveness. Let's pray for that now. Let's pray together. You alone are, are our God, our hope and help, but we do not always find it easy to love you with all our being. Our hearts, our minds, our strength do not always seek what is worthy of our trust and hope. Nor do we always find it easy to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. When we find ourselves far from your kingdom, draw us near. Forgive us when we fail and bring us home to you, the one whose name is love. Amen. Through the love and forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ, we are not far from the kingdom. We belong to this kingdom and we rejoice in the saving help of our God. Amen. Our anthem this week comes from the movie The Prince of Egypt and we're going to hear two English girls singing it, two sisters, Lucy and Martha Thomas. Lucy, I believe, is 17 and Martha is 11. Let's hear their version of When You Believe. Many nights we pray 
With no proof anyone could hear In our hearts a hopeful song We barely understood Now we are not afraid Although we know there's much to fear We were moving mountains long before we Have you ever eaten beef stroganoff? I can't remember if I've ever had anything coming close to the real thing, but I do know that since I arrived in Canada I've eaten quite a lot of beef stroganoff flavoured hamburger helper. In fact, we called it splodge as our kids were growing up, and although it's never going to win any culinary awards, I actually quite like it. Beef stroganoff came from Russia 
And although there are all kinds of variations, such as being served with either rice or pasta or potato, the basics are always the same, beef and sour cream. And that's a problem. Nowhere in the Bible does anyone ask Jesus if it's okay for us to eat beef stroganoff. But they could have. You see, according to Jewish law, meat and dairy products should never be mixed. You should never put beef in sour cream. It's against the law for an observant Jew to eat beef stroganoff. Who knew? This is based on various verses in Exodus and Deuteronomy that say simply that it's forbidden to stew a young goat in its own mother's milk. From that has come this blanket law banning the mixing ever of meat and dairy. That's the kind of extreme to which the Jewish law had got to by the time one of the teachers of that law came to Jesus and asked him which, which commandment is the most important. For some reason, Jesus didn't answer, thou shalt not eat beef stroganoff. Fancy that. No, instead he went straight to the heart of the matter. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself. Those are the most important commandments and even the Jewish legal expert had to agree. Knowing what is required of us though is a whole lot easier than actually doing it, isn't it? Loving God should be the easy part, but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes there are things that happen in life that leave us angry and confused, even with God. But if loving God can sometimes be tricky, how about loving the neighbours? How about that part? Sometimes even loving yourself isn't as easy as it should be. Actually, thou shalt not eat beef stroganoff would be much easier, I think, wouldn't it, than being told to love your neighbour as yourself. Just Find something else. If you can't eat beef strong enough, find something else and move on. Or eat the beef and then later eat the pasta in the sour cream sauce. As long as they're not mixed, you'd be all right. Or you could simply try to forget that beef strong enough ever existed and move on with your life. That would be relatively easy, wouldn't it? compared with loving your neighbour. Loving people can be a challenge. Just driving down the street, it's not easy to love some of those other drivers. It reminds me of this quote from Peanuts. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. And you know what? I know where he's coming from. And in the case of this commandment, we can't just move on and forget all about people that annoy us, because often they're going to keep coming back. If we've met them once, we're likely to meet them again. And so we have to be ready to love them. The good news is that loving your neighbour as yourself doesn't mean that you have to think they are wonderful people. It isn't really about what you think about them at all. Loving someone and liking someone aren't necessarily the same thing. Liking someone is based on your feelings. 
Quite often we have no idea why we like or dislike someone. We simply do. There's just something about them. I guess you could also say the same about romantic love. It's equally hard to quantify that. But of course Jesus isn't talking about romantic love. If he was, loving your neighbour would take on a completely different meaning, wouldn't it? Might I suggest instead that the love that Jesus is talking about here isn't a feeling at all. It's an action. Loving our neighbours isn't something we feel, it's something we do. It's giving hamburger helper and any other groceries to the food bank even when your own budget is a little tighter than you would like it to be. And when you give to the food bank, you give without asking them to guarantee the kind of person that they'll give the food to. You just give and allow them to distribute to those in need. You don't say, I only want it to go to the good people. Loving your neighbour can be just sitting with someone through their troubles, even when you haven't got a clue how to help them in practical terms. It's just being there for them, even though you might at that time have something else planned or would much rather be somewhere else. You do it anyway. That's loving your neighbour. It's also praying for someone's recovery, even when you know they've brought their condition on themselves because of their way of life, and your gut instinct tells you that they're only getting what they deserved. In fact, loving your neighbour is often about going beyond what your gut instinct tells you to do. Loving someone isn't trying to make them into the person you think they could be. It's giving them the means that enables them to choose to do that for themselves. That is the only way to success. You can't make them, but you can be there to empower them. A little boy was helping his mum in their garden when he came across some daffodils growing. He really liked those bright yellow flowers. But some of them were still only in bud. So he took one of those and started to peel back the layers in the hope of forcing the flower to blossom. Of course it didn't work, and he ended up with a small pile of split petals on the ground and a complete mess at the end of the stem. His mum explained to him that you just can't force the flower to bloom. They had to wait for God to work on that bud from the inside. But what they could do was to make sure it got plenty of water and sunshine and they could also make the effort to keep the slugs and snails and other pests away, which the daffodil couldn't do by itself. Then with God's help, the plant would be in a great position to become the glorious flower that it was meant to be. And so it is when we love someone as we love ourselves. We can't make them be the person we would like them to be. We can only make sure that they receive the word of God and we can help them keep their demons away, encouraging them, 
but not trying to force open any qualities in them that they are not yet ready to display. It is not love to try to force people to be how they think they should be. All we can do is whatever we can to prepare the soil in which they are growing. Other faiths, quite literally, have their morality police, whose job it is to correct and punish anyone they catch breaking the rules. While there are some Christians who clearly see their role as being the morality police, I do not. I see us as the people who see others struggling and we put our arm around their shoulder. We don't throw them in jail, metaphorically speaking. We are there for them, however much or little we think they deserve our help. I see us showing empathy to everyone, not sympathy, that's different and not as much. We owe people empathy. And empathy means understanding what someone else is going through. Empathy means sharing the feelings of others when they know that they are down. Loving your neighbour is the same. It's reminding yourself that it could have been you and asking yourself, what you would want if it had happened to you. Love your neighbour as yourself. Loving God isn't saying no to beef stroganoff. It's offering your beef stroganoff to someone who is hungry. What matters to God, of course, is not our stomach, it's our hearts and giving food to someone that's hungry shows a good heart. Do you remember when Samuel went to Jesse to find out which of his sons God wanted to be anointed as king? At first, Samuel just looked at the strapping young men that Jesse's sons had become, and he thought he could tell which one looked like a king. But God said to him, no, not those. God said, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. What does God see when God looks into your heart? Amen. It's the moment in the service when I lead us in the prayers of the people and there will be a chance during this prayer for you to bring to your mind those that you wish to pray for at this time. So let us pray. 
Lord of heaven and earth, we come before you today deeply aware of all the things that you have done for us, deeply aware of the love that you have not only for us but for all people, and deeply aware from the stories of our neighbours and the descriptions in our newspapers and the things we see on the nightly news of how people need to turn to you again and to receive your loving grace. Too many have strayed from you. We pray, O oh God, for our witness to those people as believers. Help us to use the power that you have given us to share what we have found out about you through word and deed. We thank you, O oh God, for the church for those you have called together for the purpose of worship and praise and mutual encouragement, for the purpose of teaching and learning about you, for the purpose of praying and of caring for each other and for the world. Loving God, even though we might not all be gathered together in one place, we do find peace in the fellowship that we share with one another we find your presence and the peace that it brings. We pray, O oh God, that as a church, we would use the power you have given us to reach out to the world, to our neighbours, and to fulfil our calling as your people, which is to love our neighbour as we love ourselves and as you love us. Hear us now, as we pray for those who are our neighbours today. We ask these things and we praise you and bless you through the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And now, as we are called to go and be neighbours to one another, I'm going to close with a blessing. Go into the world in peace knowing that the Lord goes with you every single step of the way. So in turn, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. Amen.
Once again into our 